You're listening to Metal and High Heels, the official podcast from the magazine about metal, lifestyle, and entertainment. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Metal and High Heels podcast. I am your host, Kiki, and as always, I am here with my co-host, Steffi. Hello. And today we have a special guest. We are talking to Christine Krute. Is that right? Yes, that's me. <laughs> Would you like to introduce yourself to our listeners? Yes. Hi, I'm uh, Christine Krute. I'm a cellist and music director for the women's orchestra Little Krute. Cool. And we uh, got to know you. Uh, because of your album uh, Justice from 2019 that covers several um, Metallica hits, more or less. And that's what we are going to talk about today. But first of all, I would like to ask you about your um, musical background and upbringing and how did you start um, listening and making music? Um. I guess I started really my parents loved music a lot. Um, we always had the radio on or a record on growing up. And um, my both my parents were really into singing along or like air guitar, um, talking about all the different instruments on all the songs that you would hear. And I started playing cello when I was nine years old. And I hated it at first. It was, um, I'm short and I was really short as a kid. Um, and after a few weeks of playing it at a school, I started to really love it. And the older I got, the more I realized that it could be a, a job, like that, you know, you can be paid to make music, which as a kid just seemed like such a fantasy world, um, you know, but um, Yeah, I got older and decided I wanted to go to school for music. And here we are, 20, 21, 22 years later. And it's, um, it's been such a wonderful journey. And where did you grow up? I grew up in Greenville, South Carolina. Oh, all right. So what kind of music did you uh, start playing? And uh, wow, a um, nine-year-old cellist. Yes. That's impressive. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, when I started playing, it was, it was really, um, you know, it was in like classes. So we, we played a lot from these children's like learning books called Suzuki. Um, it's a lot of like classical music that's been arranged for, for kids. And I tried to learn a lot by ear. Um, and listen a lot at home, but my parents were uh, not classical music listeners. It was a lot of um, rock and roll, uh, a lot of Van Halen and Frank Zappa. <laughs> Hell yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. A big rock household, which I think is why I'm in the, in the career that I am in today and, you know, grew up not to be a classical player, but grew up to be in like more of the rock, um, rock and jazz world. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I'd never, I love classical music. I love playing it. I love listening to it, but I, I never really felt in my heart, like it was something that I wanted to pursue as anything other than just like a hobby. Okay. Yeah. So is that, um, the reason that, uh, yeah, rock childhood, yes. <laughs> uh, so to say, um, to, to cover, a whole Metallica album, but in a yeah classical way. Oh yeah, so you know the Metallica project wasn't even my idea. Um, so the label Chesky Records, um, one of their A and Rs called me and asked if I would be interested to do that because he really wanted to bring this Metallica album to life in a different way. Um, and I had listened to Metallica before, but it wasn't. Um, It just wasn't on in my house a lot growing up, um, and I wasn't super familiar with their work. I knew um, what I had heard on the radio and just as 
you know, hearing it in, in, even in college and like, you know, music theory classes, we would listen to it because the, their writing is like so dense and interesting. But, um, Jeff called me, Jeff Lanier called me and wanted to discuss doing this record with, um, with a classical style orchestra, which for, for me would be mostly strings. That is what Little Cruda is primarily comprised of. Um, but it really turned out to be like the perfect combination of like classical and rock, I think, for this project. Mm-hmm. Um, but you work together with a uh, jazz and soul vocalists. I, yeah, my first, I, I was a little bit surprised as I read it because I thought, okay, um, of course, they're an orchestra that's. Well, not not common, but I thought about Apocalyptica, who also did um, yeah similar stuff, and yeah, but the jazz and soul vocalist was okay. Well, that that might be different. Yeah. <laughs> I expected yeah more uh, yeah rock vocals. Yeah, I think it was um, it was a good choice to go in a totally different direction. I think um, because. It could be there, you know, there are a lot of everyone wants to cover Metallica, you know, um, and there are so many incredible covers that are in that rock vein. And I think it it really made the album stand out. The fact that like the the writing was so um, rhythmic in like a rock sense, but then the the progression of the songs and even the vocalists to have them as like a softer like feminine jazz style is is so you know 180 from what you would hear from a typical metallica cover or even from metallica themselves um it just it really colored the songs in a such a completely different way they're almost unrecognizable but in a very good way <laughs> yes i agree so how was it or was it different for you to work with an all female orchestra? No, um that's been pretty much what Little Cruda has been doing for the past few years. Um most of even before Little Cruda most of the time that I was given the opportunity to hire artists, I would try my best to hire as many women as possible. Um it's, you know, growing up and being in school or even being a young professional in the the music scene it's primarily men um which is mm -hmm. great there are some great guys you know out there but it's it can be difficult sometimes to be comfortable or make your voice heard um or be respected in kind of like the right way um you know it's just the reality that you know, not, not all men uh, care about women in a professional sense when it comes to music making. So it's been a really special thing that Little Cruda has been able to do to really bring together an incredible level of artistry and professionalism, but have them be women. Um, and it's something that I, yeah, I can't imagine working in a different way at this point. That is something that uh, I was going to ask. And also, um, I think we might have to <laughs> take a, a quick step back and um, just analyze all of this in different parts because we are otherwise uh, running very quickly <laughs> <Sure. laughs> through all of the topics. <laughs> and there is so much and so many interesting stuff that uh, you can probably tell us about. And so um, I was still a little, um, or I am still very interested in learning a little bit more about your background. Sure. Um, where did you go to school? How was it? How was that experience? All, all of the formative, um, all of your musical training and uh, there, how, how was it to, um, to be one of the probably few women, as you were just saying? Yeah. Um so I went to two really great schools. In high school, I went to a boarding school for the arts mm -hmm. um, called the South Carolina Governor's School for the Arts and Humanities. It's in South Carolina, of course. Mm -hmm. um, but it 
it's it was a very small school and it was designed kind of like a pre-college. So you had your major and you also had your academic courses. So I majored in cello performance. Um, mm-hmm. And I really learned there. We had this great strings class there every morning at 8 a.m. called Concertato. And it was um, conductorless chamber ensemble. And wow. we had our teacher would come and she would just kind of sit in the theater and let us run our own rehearsals and she would give us notes and um you know teach us how to how to really move as an ensemble and breathe together and look at each other for cues instead of relying on a conductor and i think that that was so life changing for me and a big part of why my orchestra is conductorless now um because of the things that she taught me there um, her name is Katie Day. So that after- is amazing. Is that is that something that happens a lot? An ensemble to not have a conductor? Uh, no, no, not at all. I think you know, for string quartets, there's no conductor. For smaller for smaller chamber ensembles, but for a larger orchestra, um, there really aren't many instances that I found when I was younger or mm-hmm. now that are able to run without a conductor. Um, and you know i have that is amazing it it's it's incredible um it really it makes you focus not on one person leading the group which is you know conductors are so incredible and in a completely incredible world of their own but but to be in a an ensemble of 10 or more people you really have to be conscious of your body language, your facial expressions, like your breathing, just as much as you are the person next to you, the person across from you, you really have to be able to latch on to someone's energy in a in a way mm-hmm. that you I don't think you get the same experience when you have a conductor. Yeah, I'm thinking exactly. That's what I'm thinking. It's not only uh the musical nerd in me that is thinking about how this would work but also <laughs> i am uh, i'm thinking about all of the social dynamics that are at play and that have to be um have to work and function well for in, for it not to become chaos right yeah. because yeah. we've always we've we've talked about so many uh, bands here on the podcast and um obviously metal bands have what maybe seven members at most mm-hmm. And then we talk about split ups and fights and whatever. And uh, from my own experience um, in bands, I've, I've I've experienced that it's it's like being in a relationship with multiple people, and that's what um, many many musicians have said, I think. And to have the same communication skills to work this kind of musical relationship in this with so many people, it must be really interesting and experience and also in uh, leadership as well and i don't know to um to make everybody have a sense of being uh welcome and respected and heard it must be really important to have a to to start yeah to develop that uh that feeling and that skill yeah um it really is a i mean develop is the perfect word it takes it it takes time to really get to know a person i think when we so i run this orchestra with a violinist uh, her name is maria m and when we talk about who we should hire for each each job or for instance for this metallica record it it really comes down to who who do we know inside and out as a person and as a professional musician um especially when you have a limited time or a very high stress situation. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, there's really limited room for guessing whether or not this person means, you know, A or B by the way that they're like moving their shoulder when they play. Like, do you want to go faster? Do you want to take time here? How are you like, how are you really phrasing this? Um, It's really special to sit down with a group of, musicians and from the time that you start playing you you instantly can read each other's body language and you know how they play um you know i know maria always likes to she can really fit 
right on top of the beat and I play a little more in the pocket. So when we play together, depending on like what genre we're playing, I know I can lean on her to kind of like bring me forward a little bit um, or, you know, vice versa. If like we need to play something that lays back a little bit, I, I can really like, you know, hold her down there. And all of that can be said for every other um, artist on our team. Uh, everyone really knows the ins and outs of their musicianship and it, it makes it um, just a really incredible experience to be able to sit down and just totally embrace another person while you're playing. That sounds lovely. But I'm sorry I interrupted you before. Um, you were still talking about your education and then we oh, yes. <laughs> went in a tangent again. <laughs> yes. So um, I finished the, at this, this high school and I went to NYU for mm -hmm. cello performance. And while I was there, spent a lot of time in the audio engineering department. Um, I made a lot of friends just in my music class that happened to be studying to be audio engineers. And I thought that was so cool. And I had never really experienced being in a recording studio before then, um, or, you know, learning about how microphones are made or, you know, the different compressors that can be used to manipulate the sound. Um, mm -hmm. And I just thought that was so fascinating and started reading about it and signing up for classes or I would just um, try to sit in on as many classes as I could or volunteer to play for any of the, the classes that needed to learn how to record um, cello. And while I was doing all of this, um, these these engineer friends of mine, if they had, you know, their own band, everyone in college has a band. <laughs> so if they had their own band and they wanted to record strings, they would call me. And if they didn't have string parts written, I was like, okay, well, you know, I'm sure I can figure it out. And I would sit down mm -hmm. and try to figure out how to arrange all these string parts for them and realize that I loved not only arranging string parts, but I loved hiring people that I knew could be fun and also be great in these sessions and the more I did that over the next three years um it just you know became bigger and bigger until I started interning at a recording studio um in New York and was kind of doing the same thing and then people started wanting to pay me for it which I thought was so funny because I didn't have any training in arranging or music direction <laughs> um mm -hmm. and I think that I think not having training in those things and really just jumping in and saying yes to as many opportunities as I could was, I think, the best thing that I could have done for myself because I was really forced to study and learn everything on my own instead of having someone teach me like a specific way that these things were normally done as one would learn in school. Um, yeah. But it's, I think, such a thrill to kind of make your own rules as you go along. It's much more uninhibiting. That's really interesting. And what led to the foundation of uh, Little Cruta? Well, while I was at this recording studio, um, I had a, a mentor at the time tell me that I should just start recording some of my arrangements because I had been talking about wanting to start a string orchestra for a long time, or I had wanted to be more involved in professional vocal, professional vocalists' recordings, you know, if they had strings on mm -hmm. an album, like, I wanted to be that person. So I started mm -hmm. just asking, the very first EP I put out um, wasn't even a Little Cruda EP, it was just, it just had my name on it. But it was, in essence, what Little Cruda is now. It was all strings and a uh, drum set and vocalists. And I, I asked um, a friend of mine, my roommate from high school, actually, she moved, ended up moving to New York. She's a fantastic violinist named Maggie Gould. And I kind of told her what I was doing. And I said, I don't have a budget. I really can only like use my, my boss's studio at night when he's not here. I have a million violin parts. Like, will you come and stack all of these with me? So I can, you know, have 
an album to show people when I tell them I want them to hire me and uh, I can like make an orchestra for them. And, Mm -hmm. you know, she said yes. And it really sounds like an orchestra. The the album is so beautiful. Um, It was a long time ago, but I still love it to this day. But it was really just the two of us trying to layer layer all these string parts over and over and make it sound like an orchestra. Um, And that was really well received. And once I had that, I was, you know, anytime I met any musician, I would say like, I can music direct an orchestra. I can write for an orchestra. Like here is something that you can listen to. It's on, you know, Bandcamp or SoundCloud, whatever it was at that, at that time. Mm -hmm. And um, I really did eventually start getting more phone calls to arrange strings or, you know, eventually um, a friend of mine from the studio started working for this production company that does a lot of um, production for artists for TV. So he had passed my name along to one of these producers. And so I started getting calls to music direct um, orchestras on TV. And that was really exciting. And um, it's, it was really just kind of uh, the, you know, the snowball effect, this one little thing, you just keep pushing and pushing and pushing. And eventually it turns into this giant creation that just seems like it came out of nowhere, but it's just, you know, years of small things. Yeah, that sounds so cool. Yeah. Um, A long journey, for sure. A long long journey. (laughs) Um, And I think, you know, I have a lot of great male friends that I had been hiring for a long time. And it was really, I would say, at the end of 2017, um, beginning of 2018, when I decided that I wanted to officially make Little Crew to all women. Um, Mm Mm-hmm which has just been the most wonderful, special decision I think I've made in the last few years. Um, And I hear that from a lot of the women that I hire because there haven't been many opportunities for us to play in a, in a group. That's just us. um, That's just women and can be completely comfortable environment. And um, yeah, it's just been amazing. That sounds great. Can we dive a little deeper then, right at that point when you decide to make it an all women's orchestra and and the reasons behind it? Because I uh, read an article the other day that I'm trying to find so that I can link it in the show notes. By the way, before we go uh, forward... All of the show notes for this and every episode, of course, are on our website, metal-end-highheels.com slash podcast 80 for this episode. The number 80, this is our 80th episode. That is wow, so cool. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yes. And thanks everybody out there for uh, still listening to us. Um, all right. So the the article I was Uh, referring to is from the empowered musician Mm -hmm. that is uh an online magazine or blog and it is from it is pretty recent um we are recording on november 30th and this was just from a week ago and it talks about the world of opera and how uh male opera singers have just much more opportunities and um in general there are way um, or a lot more roles Mm -hmm. for them leading roles uh, mostly and how the the systemic sexism in the uh, opera world uh works it's a pretty long but very interesting article that i uh, as i said i'm going to link but i thought maybe uh, there would be a parallel to the um well, it's still the classical world of the orchestra, mm-hmm. right? So what is your experience in, in that sense? Well, I think um, I can't really speak to the opera world as much, but I can definitely say as anyone in the music industry, it is more commonplace to walk into a room and have that room be nine out of 10 men to women ratio. Um, you know, I worked at a recording studio for a long time and I was maybe like one of 
two or three women that worked there and the other, you know, 28, 30 people that worked there were men. Um, oh. uh, you know, walking into a recording session, all of the engineers are usually men. All the producers are usually men. It's very rare to see a woman on the, the engineering side of everything. Um, mm-hmm. And even the same for, for a lot of the session work I did for a long time. Um, it was mostly men or, you know, a couple women. And I wasn't sure why for a long time it, it was like that. I think in the world of audio engineering, um, it's just um, male dominated. It's been male dominated for a long time. I think it can go all the way back to when radio and recorded music started and, you know, mm-hmm. women weren't really allowed in those workplaces or they were you know harassed to the point that they never went back to those workplaces um you know i the recording studio that i worked at i loved i loved everyone that i was there but i eventually quit because the man for whom i was working harassed me to the point where i didn't feel safe there anymore um for a lot of tv performances that i've done that i'm extremely grateful for and i had fun on all of them um You know, for a lot of them, I was asked to, you know, dress sexy or hire women who looked sexy. Um, There were a few times that I, you know, a producer would ask me to submit names and photos um, of, you know, different women to be on, you know, this TV show or this TV show. And some of those women, they said no because they didn't look sexy enough. And it wasn't really the caliber of playing they were interested in. It was, you know, how, you know, how high is your sex appeal? Um, oh, you know, wow. And for TV, I, as a, as a director and as a producer, I understand that, yes, there needs to be a certain look. But I think in terms of like, I think for men, it's not, not often have I been asked for you know, sex appeal for men. It's, can you send us a cool guy, you know, that plays guitar or, you know, mm-hmm. if, if any guitarist gets hired, it's like, great, we'll just like have costume, throw a leather jacket on him and some sunglasses and he's fine. But for women, <laughs> you know, but for women, it's like, you know, how big is her cup size? Like how big are her eyes? Like, is her waist a certain size? Like, what does she look like in a crop top? Um, not, you know, what's her resume? What's her biography? Um, how those are real specifics that have been asked. Yeah. Um, wow. You know, yes. And it's, you know, like I said, I'm, I'm grateful for all the work that I've done and, you know, I've played on TV in a crop top and I loved it. It was amazing. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, you could, but I, you know, I would wear a paper bag to perform on TV. It's such a rush, but, um, you know, I think not enough people, men and women or non-binary artists really uh, want to talk about this enough because people are scared to lose their jobs. People are scared to seem ungrateful or, you know, producers don't want to hear someone saying these things because they don't want to be seen as like the bad guy. Um, Mm -hmm. And, you know, I say all this hoping that I don't lose any jobs, but at the same time, you know, I, I hope that this can inspire more people to, uh, be more open when they think about hiring um and like especially for for things that are being telecast um for recording sessions it's i think not as it it's not as blunt uh look wise but you know i think if you ask any artist you know maybe not in 2020 but maybe a year or two ago you know Mm -hmm. name name five for me name five string players or five horn players that are absolutely incredible. Most of the people that I asked would name five men, you know, without a second thought, just like, Mm -hmm. you know, and it's, it's something that I had to deprogram from my mind for a long time too, because I was really only meeting men in these situations. And Mm -hmm. it's, it's taken me a lot of like, uh, random Facebook messaging or random Instagram DMs to women that I would see on the scene. And I was like, oh, she's really cool. Her playing is really awesome. And, you know, I hope this doesn't seem weird that I'm like randomly messaging you, but I would love to just like get a coffee with you or, 
you know, get to know you and hopefully like we can build on something together, even though we've never been in the same room before, because there's never space for us to be in the same room. Um, and really just trying to like build those bridges where there haven't been opportunity to build them before. You have been doing the good feminist work of empowering your female colleagues and <laughs> and bringing them and sharing your opportunities, really. And that is very, very amazing. That is incredible. Thank you. Um, I, I really love, I, a long time ago, I heard the phrase, a rising tide lifts all boats. And yes. I think, you know, there is so much competition instilled in us women uh, when we're very young. Um, you know, TV, movies, magazines, all kind of pit women against each other, especially in the mm -hmm. workplace. And I, a long time ago, made a promise to myself that if I'm ever presented with an opportunity to climb up, I would try to bring as many women as I could, because I think that that's something that we all should, we have to be more conscious about, you know, we're, we're all mm -hmm. on the same team. We're not fighting each other. We're fighting something that's bigger than all of us when it comes to success. And I think it's much more enjoyable and um, healthy to, to live in a, a f this, this like fun world of like succeeding with, you know, your sister instead of, you know, trying to be the only woman in the room. Hell yeah. Mic drop on that one. <laughs> and, and before we start, um, because I can listen, I can hear these voices already um, of people trying to argument against this. And yes. uh, my response to that is always the moment where um, it's 50-50, the moment when, where uh, you see, I don't know, um, musicians in general female and male and that's a 50 50 uh, distribution and uh, the moment where festival billings um are full of women as well then we can maybe just you know make it random and yes just look for the best music musicians but until then we still have to do this work and yes. we still have to talk to women on this podcast and we still have to uh, pick all of the women in metal we find so interesting and they are so very great. It's not just because they're women that we talk to them. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, that is uh, you, the utopia we're all striving for. And meanwhile, we will keep doing this. And that is what we wanted to talk about. So uh, Little Cruda is a thing. You are performing on TV and... Um, working with uh, great female musicians as well. Um, and so you were mentioning before uh, Jeff Lanier from Chesky Records. Big shout out because he was the one who contacted us and made us aware of your work. And um, also Chesky Records is uh, has a very peculiar philosophy, uh, I find. They want to create the illusion of live musicians in a real three-dimensional recording yeah. so with uh, the technology and such details as microphone placement and stuff like that uh, with a pretty cool recording team I'm, I'm assuming um, they create these uh, great recordings and so they got in touch with you to make the uh, Metallica album happen how was that experience um, a thrill, like from beginning to end. Um, we had a, a very short time frame from the time that Jeff and I first spoke to the time when we would actually record the album, um, mm -hmm. you know, and which I love, you know, I love short timelines. Uh, I really thrive on that kind of <laughs> adrenaline rush. <laughs> All right. Um, and so he called and said that he wanted to do a, this Metallica record with the orchestra and I could have kind of like full reign over how, uh, how I wanted to do it, who I wanted to hire, you know, who should do the arrangements and all that. And um, I think at first I said I wanted to do maybe strings, piano and um, drums. And he said, no piano, let's just do strings and you know, like some kind of non-typical drums. And so I said, great. 
I'll hire Rosie Slater. She is an incredible percussionist. And so we have this like very, um, you know, weird mix of just, we had four violins, two violas, one upright bass, one cello, and this percussionist who brought, I think, every piece of percussion, hand percussion that I had ever seen in my life. (laughs) And then four singers, which is, you know, something that I think you don't really hear often. Um, which again is something that I love. I love weird, um, weird combinations of instruments and, uh, you know, doing something different that you haven't heard before. I think it really can, you can engage the listener in such a different way, which is what exactly what this album did. Um, especially with the addition of these jazz vocalists. Um, Mm -hmm. I, I told Jeff that I thought it would be really beautiful to maintain the Little Cruda brand and have it be all women, um, including the vocalists. There were some really great male vocalists that we had been discussing at first. And then, um, you know, I, I spoke to Maria, my partner, about it for a long time. And we, we decided that it would be best just to keep it all women, um, except for our amazing arranger. Um, his name is Pierre Piscatelli. Um, who I met when I was at NYU, he was studying um, composition and piano. And there really uh, was no one that I could imagine would do a, a better job than Pierre when it came to arranging. He is just one of the greatest I've ever met. Um, and this album really, like, if it wasn't solidified in my mind, it's solidified now. He is, he is absolutely brilliant. Um, mm-hmm. And he wrote these arrangements so quickly like you know in just a few weeks and we had you know by the time he was finished we really only had a week until the recording session so we had one rehearsal with this orchestra and like i mentioned earlier because these women each woman on the project was hired for a very specific reason you know um adi is an amazing adi meyerson is the bass player she's an incredible jazz bass player and mm-hmm. Rosie Slater is this amazing percussionist and, you know, this like each violinist, each violist plays in such a specific way and like the different strengths that they bring to the table. It, it just made it so easy to lock in. You know, the rehearsal was only, I think, three or four hours. And then the next, you know, two days later we were recording um, and we got this absolutely wow. incredible record from it. Um, yeah. So it was just a thrill from beginning to end. That's amazing. And to go a little bit into more detail about the album, I think uh, Steffi has more questions about that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, probably. Um, so um, the location, it was an old church in Brooklyn. Yes. Um, how did you choose it? The label Is chose it, because- it. I think that they had recorded there before and they had booked it for, I think, a month to record a few other projects there as well. Okay, so um, it's also about the um, acoustic, not just because it's a church, <laughs> like uh, like yeah, church is a symbol for yeah classic music. Yeah, well the it's, so the acoustics in this this specific church are very interesting. So it's very old, um, from the 1800s, and it's been decommissioned for a long time. Um, so the floors are still carpet, the walls are very high, everything is very old wood it hasn't been um treated or painted in years so when it's uh humid in the air the wood gets really soft um and we recorded in july and it was so so hot and humid outside that you walk into the church and it was just like it felt like uh misty (laughs) so when we were actually recording in the the room that we were in sounded terrible Um, Like to the point where I was like just sweating. I was so nervous that this, all of this was just going to sound awful. And they had set up their um, listening station with all of their gear in the next room over, which um, was totally separate um, from where we were. We were in like the main worship space, I guess you could call it. And I remember walking in halfway through like the second first or second run of the day and just asking if I could listen through their headphones to hear what they were hearing because I really did not like the sound that we were getting. And I I listened and the, 
you know, a combination of the the high ceilings and the all of the different mics that they were using um, or the specific setups that they were using, I should say, um, really colored the space in a totally different way. Um, so we just kept kept going the way that we had been. Um, but yeah, it was I've I haven't experienced anything like that. I think ever where the the sound that you're hearing through the the microphone through the headphones is so different from like playing in the live the live area. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. And so, will you or do you try to um, do it again in that location? Would I? If you would like to record another, um, yeah, whatever music or songs um, in the church, if you have the opportunity. Oh yeah, I would. I would love it. Um, there was a lot of. It's big. It's a big space, and being able to really spread out from each other. You know, we it was so comfortable. Um, I like to move a lot when I play, and because we are a conductorless ensemble, you know, a big part of how we can really play together is everyone really moving a lot. Like the body language is so important. And so being able to be so spread out and like everyone could really like move or dance while they play so freely, um, you know, just physically made it feel so much better. You don't have to worry about hitting someone's elbow or knocking someone's bow. Um, you don't have to worry about, you know, the mics being so close because they were really over our heads. Um, but yeah, just the, the end product that we got, um, was such an incredible combination. I, you know, would absolutely love to record something there again. Oh yeah. Oh, it sounds amazing. Yeah. So you, it was not like, um, yeah, you're standing in the, yeah, typical orchestra position, but you also just dance around. <laughs> sounds so like you had a little party while playing and, re and recording. Yeah. I mean, I think personally, I think that, you know, the, the thing to keep in mind for, for every job that I have is to have fun. You know, at the, the end of the day, we are playing music for as a job, which, you know, if for no other reason, it's because we love it. And, you know, I love what, what better feeling is there than hearing a song that you love or creating music with someone you love and like moving your body. And I think that's a big principle that we've tried to keep at the forefront of Little Cruda, even as we move into these, you know, whether we're playing on TV or recording an album in a church or just recording in a studio and, you know, no one will even see us. We don't know if we're being filmed, like, you know, but just the, the energy that like moving your body with the music brings, I think really changes the, the sound. Um, mm. And it's, you know, it's, it's, I think easier to play the more fun that you have keeps the stress level down it keeps your you know you want that childlike spirit in every note um you know music is so pure no matter what the content of it is and i think it's important to keep that um in in one's heart when you're really when you're doing this um so yeah the, the just the fact that you can have all this space to like really move around and just kind of like be yourself while you're playing was great Yeah, sounds amazing. So, um, did you ever tour it with the uh, orchestra? Because it sounds like you would do a amazing live performance. I would love to do all of those things. <laughs> um, <laughs> we were trying to figure out um, a live performance or a few for this album in particular um, this year before COVID hit. Um, we have done. Um, two big shows uh, for this all women and non-binary series called the hum series um, where we had like a 26 piece orchestra both times um, backing up uh, like a pop pop vocalist. Um, and those were really powerful, um, just fun shows because again, my philosophy of everyone needs to like move their body on stage. When you see 26 women, you know, strings, we had, flute, piano, harp, drums, and everyone's really on stage just like swaying to this music. It's just like, you know, an ocean of love and energy. It's really amazing. Um, and we were definitely trying to do more of those kinds of shows this year, mm. but I'm thinking that will probably be postponed to the 
the end of 2021. Yeah, yeah, sadly. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully it yes. can be realized <laughs> next year. Yes. Yeah. Okay, great. Um Kiki, do you have anything else in mind? <laughs> yes, I was already thinking uh what would be next? Um are you maybe planning on taking on another uh big rock or metal project? I've been thinking about that a lot, actually. Um, you know, this album was so fun and very successful and um, well-received. I think it would be amazing to do another project like this. It would just be um, really a matter of finding a way to pay all of my artists. Um, you know, mm -hmm. everyone definitely has the time now since our industry has been put on pause for so long. We're all, you know, just trying to work from home. Um, yeah. but, um, yeah, it would, it would just be a matter of finding an investor or working with another label, um, or something like that. Uh, but definitely, definitely open to that. Do you personally listen to any, um, uh, or what do you even listen to? <laughs> oh my gosh. You know, it really depends on the day or, you know, if I have a, a client that reaches out and wants strings on something if they send any references um mm -hmm. i've been listening to i've been doing a lot of um work in pop lately so i've been listening to um a lot of pop music um there is this great artist lauv who is just an amazing songwriter that i've been listening to and um the the textures that he uses in all of his songs i think are so colorful and interesting um mm -hmm. And I've been listening to a lot of James Blake. He's had a lot of new music come out lately. And I think the the work that he does with, you know, his like vocal and piano infusions really speaks to me as as an arranger and a a cellist in such a different way. Um but yeah, a lot of James Blake and Lauv, definitely. <laughs> All right. Uh, you were mentioning um well Uh, the pandemic as well um what does your routine look like right now you were talking about working from home as well mm -hmm. but normally you would also be in the recording studio a lot maybe yeah so before covid hit i was touring with the eagles and i was nice. performing thank you <laughs> Um, and I was performing with Alanis Morissette's new Broadway show, Jagged Little Pill. Um, we were actually just wow. nominated for a Grammy, which is so exciting. It's my first one. Oh, congratulations. Thank you. That's awesome. Thank you. <laughs> um, so normally I would be either playing on Broadway or in the middle of a tour. Um, and, you know, whenever I'm on tour or my Broadway shows are just at night. So during the day I have all this free time. Um, I do a lot of arranging. So now that COVID is here and all of that has been uh, postponed, I um, have been doing a lot of recording from home and arranging from home um, for different artists. And um, I have started a YouTube series called Strings at Home, where I work with songwriters and create a strings only strings and vocal only version of um, a song that they've written. So we have two out, um, one with this incredible soul artist, his name is Modre, and another one with um, this great pop singer, Anna Shoemaker. Um, we have another song coming out with an LA-based pop soul artist named Morgan. Um, but all of these are, we um, film ourselves while we're playing, me and my partner Maria and we have the vocalist do the same and then we put out an audio version um, and we put out a video version so everyone can see how we're um, still able to collaborate while we're all kind of quarantined in our respective homes and that's been really special just to connect with these these artists that I've maybe met never or once before um, and really talk about their songs and a different, more intimate way and how the song means something different to them now being totally isolated than it did when they, you know, maybe then 
it did when they wrote it, you know, months or years ago. Um, so that's been my main focus uh, as of now. And it's been uh, really healing, I think, for me to get up every day and work on something that, that has nothing to do with, um, you know, anything else other than this like collaboration of love between Little Cruda and uh, this singer. That sounds like a lot of fun as well. And really interesting to watch. So we are going to link your uh, YouTube channel and also have some videos in our show notes. But um, is there anything else you would like to tell us, talk about anything you're promoting at the moment? Um, let's see. I'm very excited about the YouTube. Um, all of our new releases i have a spotify playlist of all of the little cruder releases so people can subscribe to this playlist and hear all of our songs in one place that we've worked on including the justice record um we recently um were part of a new song with this south african artist named manana and um that was released maybe a month ago um, mm -hmm. other than that playlist, we have like, I mean, gosh, every, every woman in the orchestra just has such incredible projects going on. Um, Molly Fletcher, one of the violinists, she played second violin on our album. She has this, uh, beautiful violin record, um, that she released last year called Reverie. And it's all, um, different violin looping, very meditative, very calming. It's been actually a big part of my routine the last eight months, um, you know, when I get stressed out or bummed out from being alone all of the time. Um, you know, I, I practice a lot of yoga and I meditate a lot. And this, mm -hmm. this project has actually been a big part of keeping me grounded. Um, I know Adi, the bassist, um, has released a lot of music as well. Um, her last record was called Where We Stand. Um, and she received a lot of awards for it, but it's all instrumental jazz that she's written and uh, arranged. Um, Katie Jacoby, uh, who was a soloist on the record Justice, has released a lot of music. She also plays, um, she's the soloist for the band The Who. Um, she's mm -hmm. absolutely incredible. But her album that she just released is called Bluebird, and it's, um, you know, similar. It's very meditative and. Um, calming violin music she also has this like kind of like um rock fiddle record out that's just self-titled called katie jacoby um where she plays violin and sings um and has this absolutely incredible band behind her um yeah you know there's just endless endless projects i could tell you about <laughs> <laughs> that's so cool and we will have um as many as links as I can possibly research. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll send all of them. Perfect. Then we will have them all on our um, show notes. Uh, as I mentioned before, metal-and-highheels.com slash podcast 80. That's where you will find everything. Yes, and you can follow the podcast on Spotify, on Stitcher also. Or, yeah, subscribe on iTunes or wherever you would like to listen to your podcasts. And, um, yeah, I think we're out of questions <laughs> right now. Okay. Thank you so um, much for having me. This has been just wonderful to talk with you both. Thank yeah, you so thank much you. for your time. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah, congratulations again for your all your projects and, yeah, your yeah your huge motivation for the woman in metal or not metal but music in general yes and yeah it's it's an amazing work thank you good to know <laughs> that you're out there yes yes we are we're all you know working together even oceans apart yeah exactly all right so um at the end um of course uh, our jingle is based by the song storm um by Cassandra Novell and her, burn, her band Mercy Isle. And yeah, I think that's, that's it, our episode. 
And um, yeah, see you here next time. Thank you. Thank you so much for the very inspiring um, stories and information and for your time. And everybody out there, thank you so much for listening. We will be back with another episode before the year is over and uh, next year as well, of course. <laughs> yes, exactly. Happy holidays. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, everybody. Bye-bye.